Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome uh, Neil. Neil's from the Software Sustainability Institute, and he's travelled all the way down from Edinburgh to here, which is very lovely of him. And he's going to be talking to us about surviving in the post expert world. Thank you very much. All right. Can everyone hear me at the back? I, I might be top, so hopefully this will be this will be good. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be down here talking to you all. Um, I've got a slightly provocative title for my presentation. I hope you'll realize by the end of it why it's, it's slightly provocative. But before I, I launch into the talk, one of the things I wanted to do was get a sense of who's in the room. So um, who here considers that they do research? Okay. Um, who who would say that they provide support to researchers? Okay. Um, who is someone who develops software? Okay. And who here would consider themselves an expert? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So um, so this talk is for you. Um, so one of the things that um, I like to do is kind of understand where we are in the world as researchers. And as almost all of you are doing research just now, I think it's a slightly scary place to be in. Um, any economists in the room? No. Oh, yes. OK. So you, you might recognize this quote here. <laughs> so this is the this is lovely, uh, lovely Michael Gove um, saying that people in this country have had enough of experts. And by experts, He's talking about economists, and as you are one of the people who put up your hand um, for both uh, being an economist and being an expert, he's talking about you. So um, what does this really mean? And what does this mean for us as researchers? And what does this mean for a research software workshop? Um, so one of the things as a researcher that I like to do is try and examine the evidence. So let's see what the evidence is to back up this particular kind of statement. Now, the great thing is that we have wonderful research organizations of different types um, all across the, um, the UK who are collecting data. And what we can do is we can look at that data and see what it says. So one of the things we could look at is the Ipsos Mori Veracity Index, which is something that's been going on since the mid 80s, which simply surveys a representative population of people every year to find out what they put their trust in. And as you can see, um, people really put their trust in things like doctors, teachers, um, for the purposes of, of uh, this talk, scientists also encompasses researchers, and hairdressers. So basically, hairdressers are pretty much the, uh, one of the, the most trusted professions. And you know, this is all good. But, but the data says that uh, researchers are well trusted by the public. So you know, how, how does this kind of... Um, uh, compare with the statement we've heard from Michael Gove, particularly when, when you look at the data again and look at the five least trusted professions, um, you end up with government ministers and politicians generally being at the bottom of that pile. So, so what's going on here? You know, we've got, we've got a statement here that says, you know, people don't believe in experts anymore. And then you've got another, uh, you've got the data saying, well, yes, they do. Um, so what, what's going on here? Um, one of the problems here is around perception. So again, um, we look at another piece of research. National Center for uh, Social Research is uh, a, a group that looks at trust in other bodies. And one of the things here is public confidence in official statistics. So the Office of National Statistics collects a, a large amount of data that's then used by other organizations. And one of the things that their research showed is that the problem is not that the public doesn't trust us, uh, sorry, doesn't uh, trust the Office for National Statistics to produce good statistics. So two thirds of the people surveyed there uh, think that the ONS produces reliable statistics. It's how they're then used and represented. So only 28% agreed that the government presents these figures honestly. And only 19% agree that newspapers present these figures um, honestly. So the problem is one of perception of how the data is being used. And you can see this in many different areas of research. Uh, 
most famously climate change, where you can see the same sets of data being skewed in many different ways to support many different arguments. Um, but you can see it in almost every different uh, area of research. So there's the problem. To become an expert is more than just doing the good work. To become an expert, you need to uh, have people trust in your expertise because they believe in your reputation. And so as a researcher or someone who does research or someone who supports researchers, the thing that's really important to understand is that your reputation is pretty much everything. So how do we ensure, particularly when we're dealing with research software, that people can trust in you because they believe in your reputation? And this is kind of where we go on to the bit, which is the downhill part of this talk. So the problem we have is that everyone can make mistakes. Um, anyone heard of Reinhardt and Rogoff? Uh, so yeah, um, Reinhardt and Rogoff, again, effectively economists. Um, so doing work that has produced a large number of uh, seminal papers so very well respected in their field. Um, they produced a paper called Growth in a Time of Debt, uh, which looked at the way that uh, countries' economies um, evolved and adapted and changed in response to different types of stimulus measures. Um, published it, used to create a lot of uh, policy by different national governments. Also used uh, by one um, university on their undergraduate course, as a way of teaching people, uh, teaching their undergraduate students to review and assess papers. So what, they, uh, what this course did was say to all of their students, um, as part of your kind of um, grounding in how to do good research, we want you to do a literature review, we want you to take a paper, and we want you to try and recreate its results and see how easy that was. Um, most people chose much easier papers, one student, chose uh, growth in the time of debt, tried to recreate the results, and discovered that they couldn't. And they went, ah, this is a bit odd. Um, and then they did, they did a very surprising thing. They went and they simply emailed Reinhardt and Rogoff, and Reinhardt and Rogoff did a really surprising thing. They emailed back and said, ah, that's, that's really odd. But here, you can have our data set, um, and you can have our code. Um, and in their case, the data set and the code were all combined in an Excel spreadsheet, sent it off to the student, the student looked at it, and went, you don't seem to be summing all of the rows of this column. And Reinhard and Rogoff went, you're right. And so what, what we have here is we have um, a paper which is using good data, but because of an error in a spreadsheet, is actually coming up with outcomes which are completely wrong. And normally, um, for most papers, it would be very unlikely that anyone would ever spot that. The thing with this paper, of course, is firstly, someone found it. Secondly, the authors were good enough to provide their code and data so that they could be checked. Uh, fourthly, that they accepted that it was a mistake. But uh, last of all, the issue here is obviously, this is the main paper that was used to set most of the austerity measures that are currently applied by a number of governments across the Western world. So a small error, very small here, can have far-reaching implications. And again, when we talk about reputation, something like this is potentially devastating. Now, um, this, is the, uh, this is another example. Um, uh, famously, this is one of the first ones that came up. Uh, uh, a, a scientist called Chang here. Again, he's, he's someone who is considered at the forefront of their field. Um, when we're looking at uh, kind of molecular structures, he pioneered a number of the um, biggest advances in different types of techniques, both on the computational and the measurement side, to create almost a, a new subfield in his area. Uh, for him, it was even worse. The person who picked up the mistake in one of his um, code scripts was one of his own group who tried to use it and then discovered that there was an error where Again, two columns were being flipped when the data was being read in, which caused a very subtle problem. It's basically the difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right, which I can't tell the difference on. I can see they're different, but I could not tell you which one's the correct one. 
Um, and as a result, um, Chang had to retract five of his papers. And this is something which, again, when you're talking about the reputation of someone, the fact that um, he had to re retract five of his papers means that a lot of people will then wonder whether or not the rest of the work he's done is correct. But as they said, you know, the rest of people in his field are going like, his data is good. It's just that his code is bad. So you've got to be really careful here because this can happen to lots of different people. This is the example now where I ask, is there anyone from zoology from the University of Cambridge here? You may know this example then. Um, this is an example which is kind of, I, I'm going to use it as a, a case of really good practice. It's a very recent example. Um, Laurenti here is uh, someone in the uh, Department of Zoology in Cambridge who was the lead author on a paper that went into science around um, the, uh, basically around population migration from Africa outwards into Europe. Um, here is an example of a worldwide consortium of many different universities um, who are all working together to bring together a number of um, new techniques. So a new technique to um, basically extract samples from very old uh, bone matter, um, a new technique for uh, basically analyzing these samples and cleaning them up, all that allows uh, this consortium to take this, this data and combine it with what we already know about populations to give us new knowledge around how people uh, migrated um, it through history. And the big outcome of this, which is reported across almost all of the, uh, the scientific publications and the popular science press, was that um, as a result of doing all of this work with these new samples, uh, we didn't just see that there was a population migration from Africa out into Europe, but there was also a later migration from Europe back into Africa, which obviously is um, a spectacular new result. Except, if you've read the text at the bottom, it's not a new result. It's an error in one of the bioinformatics pipelines. Basically, what had happened was uh, one of the cleaning steps they did threw out more values than it should have because it wasn't expecting to get values in the range that it was getting because there was new data coming in from a new technique. And as a result, it threw off every uh, step after that. So one very small um, uh, error in one part of the pipeline caused a completely different set of outcomes uh, to happen. So how many people are PhD students in this room? OK, this one's aimed at you then. So, uh, so, so this, is, this is all good. This is, this is an example of a really good thing to happen, because um, some other people in the community uh, picked this up. Um, the data is all published openly, the methodology is all published, so other members of the community could take a look and find out exactly where in the pipeline it went wrong. Of course, that first author is still a PhD student, and so can you imagine your first big paper, which has hit national press, then having to have a correction um, put in? It's not, the, it's not the easiest way of starting off your career as a researcher, but the good thing is, so this is, this is like six or seven years later than the other example. It's an example where the community kind of goes, actually, you just made a mistake. You know, you're not, you're not being fraudulent. You just made a mistake. So the question is, how often are these mistakes being made? Uh, so how many people are actually at risk of doing this? And the thing that I, I can now sort of say to people who are starting off PhD careers is, don't worry about it, because it's everywhere. So these are three very high profile um, cases. But then you've got research that looks into almost every area. So if we look at um, uh, cancer research, when we look at preclinical studies, there's a famous um, uh, paper that tried to recreate 53 of, the, of what they call the landmark publications, so the things which are considered the cornerstones of this area, and 47 of them could not be reproduced. If you look at uh, genetics, again, um, repeatability of everything that's been published in a certain um, time frame in microarray gene expression, they couldn't repeat half of these, 30% because of the software. Um, you think computer science is any better? Um, no, computer science is almost always worse in this case. Uh, of, of the 600 or so papers that were published in ACM journals and proceedings, uh, there's basically two, two thirds of them fail for different reasons. Um, so all across all different subjects, we're not doing great, but, um, the point is that it's not as bad as the mainstream press 
um, say it is. So most of the mainstream press have uh, focused on the problem. They're kind of going like, oh, it's terrible. Um, academics write this horrible spaghetti code. Um, uh, basically, it's amazing that anything actually compiles or runs or gives you anything at all. Um, it's not actually that bad. What I like to, uh, to say is there are a lot of problems. Reproducibility is definitely an issue for all of our fields. It's so much better than we were doing 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So the point here is that was a depressing bit. What can we do to make sure that we're always getting better? Um, and I guess one of the things that we can do is publish and share our data and our code. Um, and there's been a lot, again, in the mainstream press that's sort of saying, uh, you must do this because uh, it's, it's absolutely essential for a lot of areas for reproducibility. Um, ben Goldacre, who a lot of you will have heard of, has been one of the people who's been getting um, on at journals to do this for areas where there is a potentially high economic and social impact because what we're talking about here is the ability to treat people um, for, for diseases that may or may not save their lives more efficiently. Um, but I like to think of it as the other way. I, I'm a kind of pragmatist and I think the reason why you should care about this is not so much because you're doing the right thing for science but because you're doing the right thing for yourself. Um, so uh, actually I'm going to skip forward a little bit now. Um, so one of the things that we noticed is that um, as well as kind of like this idea of uh, doing reproducibility, sharing your code and data because it helps the community, it also helps yourself. So um, I'm going to go and give a few more examples about that, um, but I'm going to kind of take a slight segue. So one of the ways of doing this is simply by improving the kind of skills um, you, you have as a researcher. And a few years ago, um, a group of us got together to write this thing called Best Practices for Scientific Computing. Uh, it's a paper that listed evidence-based um, uh, kind of like methods for improving your practices. Uh, so there's a list of practices there. You can't see them. I'm going to suggest you don't even look at them just now. Because one of the things that we discovered when we put this out is that actually um, most researchers can't get up to the level of those practices. Not because you're not um, really good at research, not because you're not really good at coding, but mostly because uh, the sort of infrastructure and support you might have will not necessarily be there to allow you to do this. Um, in particular, one of the biggest issues that people have is the pressure on their time. So all of these things um, are practices that will make your code development more efficient, but at the cost of upfront time to learn them and start implementing them. If you start off with code which is completely fresh, that's brilliant. No one really starts off with code that's completely fresh. You're always inheriting stuff. So actually, this turned out to be really difficult. So we kind of went, all right, don't do that. So the paper I will point you to is this one, which is called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing. This is the one which I would like you to kind of like uh, take a look at, see how you're doing, and share it with all of your friends. Um, because this is the one which I hope everyone will be able to aspire to. This is the one that says, um, it's not like save your data in a repository which has a, a, a plan for how the data will be migrated in the case of a repository closing down. This is the one that says, save your data. Um, this is the one that doesn't say, kind of like, um, uh, make sure you have documentation that is a certain number of lines long for the amount of lines of code you've done. This is the one that says um, create an overview of your software so that someone else could understand the basics of what it does. So this is the kind of paper which I hope that as one of the things you take out of this talk um, it is to go and read this and share it and see how well you're doing against it. Because this is something I think everyone can aspire to. Um, because one of the biggest problems we have is um, that, as I said, the challenge is not one of intelligence, the challenge is not one of being able to pick up skills, the challenge is one of time. So the biggest barriers that people see to making um, code and data available are things like time to document and clean up, um, time to deal with uh, questions from users, and these sorts of things are things where 
if you lower your expectations and also become much more pragmatic and say, I'm only doing just enough to satisfy what I need to do, become uh, much less problematic. So you're not trying to aim for something which anyone can pick up uh, at any point from any field. You're looking for something that your colleague can work with and not shout at you because it's, it's uh, you know, unfathomable when they're trying to use it on a Monday morning. Um, and that's, that's part of a general problem. Um, so one of the issues that we have in research software today is that we don't really get very much credit for um, things like releasing software or making software easy to use or indeed just being helpful. Um, so in research, we typically uh, get credit for publishing papers. Um, one of the things that people are starting to realize, and it's a reason why you should be selfish about this, uh, is that um, publishing code and data actually increases your research impact. So what we're seeing is a number of studies showing that if you're sharing your code for purely selfish reasons, which um, is basically because you want to increase your research impact, it's in that, you know, you're, you're getting that increased citation rate. So what, what I guess um, I'm, I'm kind of suggesting you all do is understand how you can gain just enough skills to be able to do stuff that is useful for you and directly for you. So um, one of the things that has become much, much easier is getting credit for software. So if I was given this talk, um, let's see, five years ago, um, things like publishing a paper about your software would be very difficult. So five years ago, um, I started maintaining a list of journals which allowed you to uh, publish software papers. A software paper is basically a paper describing a piece of software and how it works, which doesn't have to include research results. So the, traditionally before that, what you would do is you would write a research paper which happens to mention software and then get people to cite it. Now you can just write a paper about your software, release it earlier before you finished your, um, your research paper. So we've gone from having um, five or six journals five, uh, five years ago that would let you do that to having over 70. So in all fields, you can write software papers. It's also much easier to cite software directly. If you don't want to write paper, um, the software citation principles um, from the Future of Research Communication um, group have been published this year. And what this lets you do is give you guidelines for how best to cite software directly in papers or ask for it to be cited in other people's papers so that you can gain credit because it will be more easily picked up by all of the standard bibliometric systems. Um, how many people have orchids? You have an orchid? Excellent. If you see someone who doesn't have their hand up there, talk to them in the break and explain why an orchid's really useful. Uh, for me, it's really useful because I have a name which gets uh, misspelled all over the place and also gets misspelled in lots of the um, systems that are, are run by the publishers. And it means that I don't get credit because I appear as seven or eight different researchers, none of which are actually in the uh, area of research which I, I, I think I am in. Um, there are also great tools that work with ORCIDs, things like Impact Story, that let you see how people are interacting with your research. If you haven't seen things like Impact Story and Altmetric and so on, um, I'd encourage you to look at it because it, it lets you see the, the non-traditional impact of your work. It lets you see who's tweeting about your work, who's uh, saving and sharing your papers, um, and basically whether or not, and this is the one I really love, so it's, it's about badging, whether or not one of the kind of like big celebrities has uh, taken notice of your work. Um, and finally, the other thing you can do is uh, the flip side, um, be a better reviewer as well. So one of the things that I encourage people to do is really treat reviewing as something which is not just for you, but also something where you are kind of giving professional career development to the authors that you are reviewing. So um, there are a number of different initiatives. Um, there's the Openness Initiative by the Royal Society. Um, and there's also a paper on being a good um, open science peer reviewer. We give guidelines for how you can be a better reviewer. Um, and it basically boils down to two things. One, Make sure you ask to see people's code and software so that it gets ingrained into the culture. And two, be on the side of the author. So tell them why you need to see the code and software. 
So that's all um, the kind of uh, doing it for yourself. So the, the last thing I kind of wanted to wrap up on, uh, so in the last kind of 10 minutes, is what is there out there that you can either use for help or also that you can kind of tell your colleagues, your collaborators they can use for help. So I think one of the things that is really important is that you're not the only people out there who are having these problems. These are sort of, uh, everyone has different kinds of issues, but almost everyone um, will find that someone else has reached this issue before you. So, um, I'm gonna skip that one. Um, so here's something from uh, a good friend and collaborator of mine called Croucher's Law. So I've been talking about expertise. Uh, Mike is one of the um, best experts that I know in the field of research software engineering. He is the guy who you turn to if you're at Sheffield and you have a piece of code and you want it to be better in some way. So he is an expert software developer. He's worked with researchers for um, nearly two decades. Uh, and he can basically improve your software in many different ways um, just by talking to him. Um, I first met him because, uh, weirdly, we run a program um, called the uh, Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship, which gives researchers um, a grant of uh, £3,000 to do stuff that will help research software in their area. He applied and he asked to, get, uh, to use his £3,000 for a series of 50 coffee mornings where he would chat with three, um, three <coughs> researchers each week and just uh, do this over coffee. Um, we funded him. Um, accounts hated us because they had to deal with so many receipts. Anyway, this is, this is uh, Mike Croucher, and he um, came up with this law that um, I urge you to, to remember. And his law is, I can be an idiot and I will make mistakes in my software. Um, and what this means really is that you are no different, but the reason why this is a talk about being in a post-expert world is especially when you're an expert programmer. And one of the things that I want to kind of get away from is this myth of the expert um, software developer. Because a lot of people think of um, expert software developers as these people who spend the night uh, kind of working through to the early hours, uh, hacking away, producing extremely streamlined code, which is absolutely, um, does definitely does not have any security vulnerabilities and is all tested and so on. Um, it's not like that. So all over the world, people make mistakes in their code. You're no different. Experts are no different. The big difference is that experts know that they're making mistakes in their code not because they can spot them, but because they know that when you develop code, you make mistakes. So um, I want to get away from this myth of the expert as a programmer who never makes mistakes. To become an expert, what you need to be able to understand is that you do make mistakes. And then, if you can do that, you can start understanding how to get the skills to fix the mistakes. So um, here's, a, here's a set of questions for you. Um, can you describe how you analyze your data? Who thinks that they could um, turn to the person on their left and tell them about a recent analysis of data uh, that they did and explain how that person could go on and do it? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Stephen because uh, I, I know I can I've got a <laughs> So, so um, how do you manage to do that? I would do it at multiple levels, so I think at a high level. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, I guess I, I've got to ask then is um, when you when you kind of uh, explain and um, walk them through the analysis, um, do you use any form of automation? So one of the things that uh, it really helps when you're trying to kind of um, describe your analysis is to start using some form of automation. So how many people use some form of automation, whether it's writing a script? Or using yeah. those are your people that you should talk to. The people who've got your hands up, talk to them. If you didn't have your hand up, talk to them about what they do and why they find it useful. Um, there are different reasons why it's useful. The most obvious one is 
most research, particularly when you're doing data analysis, uh, involves a lot of repetitive tasks. Um, automation, scripting, whatever you like to call it, whether it's done in something like MATLAB or R, or whether it's done using bash scripts, or whether it's use, done using Windows batch files, um, is useful because it starts reducing the errors and making it easier to catch the errors when you're doing repetitive tasks. It definitely helps as your code grows, um, and the, the corollary of that is that if you try and explain it to someone else, it's much easier because you've got something to give them. It's like giving a checklist to someone that they don't need to type in again, but that they can just run on their own computer. And you know, perhaps at some point you'll get to this ideal endpoint where all you're doing is you know, you're running a command that uh, does analysis of your data, and then it makes a paper from the results. And that's actually possible in, in many cases. And then you pass it on to someone else, and they run your clever analysis but on their data, and it makes a paper from their results. So um, that's the kind of end goal, but the start goal is to use automation of some sort and understand why it's useful for you. Um, how many people are self-taught programmers? Okay, thank you. Um, so one of, the, one of the things with being a self-taught programmer is that in general, what you end up having is very specialized knowledge. So um, I did a lot of stuff with image processing, so I understand, or at least I did understand, uh, a lot about very specific routines to clean up um, image data. Uh, I am terrible at testing. Um, so one of the things that you should do, um, and actually I encourage this even if you're not a self-taught programmer, is to get training. So keep on getting training. Um, software development is moving on a lot. Uh, there are lots of different tools that are becoming interesting for people to use. Um, in particular, if you, if you feel you've got all the basics going, there's a whole set of tools, um, some of which will appear on a slide not too far from here, around uh, making it easier to share your work with other people. Um, and so there are lots of different places you can get training. Uh, how many people have heard of software carpentry and data carpentry? Uh, excellent. I love the fact that when I started doing these talks um, uh, about four years ago, um, maybe one person would put up their hand apart from me um, when we were talking about software carpentry. Now everyone um, can can kind of like go, yeah, I know someone who's been in a software carpentry course. Um, the reason why courses like this are great are that they fill in the gaps. They give you a base foundation. Because you've all heard of them, you can go on to the next step and make sure you use that to go on to other courses on things like um, using Docker um, for uh, reproducibility or for sharing results, um, using things like Jupyter, uh, which is a way of doing um, combinations of code and uh, your paper in the same sort of electronic notebook. So use the skills you've learned on these kind of courses to find the most appropriate training that fills in the gaps in the areas you don't already have the self taught knowledge. Um, uh, how many people use version control? Excellent. How many of you think you, know you use version control such that uh, you can collaborate well with other people? Okay, again, these are your experts. Um, I, use, I use version control all the time, um, but I have to admit that mostly I use version control to stop me from screwing up when I accidentally delete something I shouldn't have. Um, using version control for collaboration is even better. Um, and the biggest thing I would say is uh, it's not just version control, but there are tools out there uh, that you can use, and most of them are free, and most of them are really good. So Whereas uh, 10 years ago, you might be really limited and you might go, I'm not using version control because I don't have anyone um, who's running it. Now, use something. Uh, use GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket. Um, see whether your university has set something up. See what your collaborators are using. Um, there are lots of other tools that let you share code. There are lots of tools that let you see the impact of your code. So um, basically, we've gone from five years ago having uh, things which were not really well tailored for researchers to use to a whole ecosystem of infrastructure that can benefit you. Um, this is the best question. Um, <laughs> this is the question that almost everyone will ask at some point. Um, so uh, what can you do to stop that? The biggest thing, and this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why it's great to run workshops like this, uh, the biggest thing that will help you over the question of why you're, you just can't understand why your code is working is talking it over with someone else. 
They don't need to be an expert. They don't need to be someone who is a great code developer because you know this is talking about the post-expert world. What you should do is find a code body of some sort. Um, the, the art of explaining something to someone else is also the art of understanding it for yourself. Um, it's, that, it's that kind of repeating something in a different way. Um, so what I encourage everyone to do is to find someone else that they can talk to about their code and you know do the same for, for that person. Um, one way of doing this, um, which has become very popular, I mentioned Mike Crouch was something called a research software engineer. Uh, there are a lot of research software engineers out there. Um, this is a picture of the research software engineering conference, the first one that was held in Manchester last September. All of these people are research software engineers. Um, a, a large proportion of these, I think uh, six or seven of them, are based in this area. So. Um, find out uh, uh, who your local contact is. You can go to the website at the bottom there, www.rc.ac.uk. There is a page there that says um, local champions, and the local champion is your first contact point for a number of different universities around the UK, uh, who has agreed to be the person that any researcher can contact to ask where the most appropriate place for them to get help with their code is. It might be them. It might be a local or informal group that's running at the university. It might be um, some other person who's involved in a larger consortium in their field. But basically, go and find someone that you can just talk to. And then the final one, you know, isn't this going to take a lot of effort? Well, that is basically back to that same question that we asked of uh, what can we do here, you know? It's great when you're starting from scratch, but it's actually quite hard if you're uh, working with legacy code. And I think the biggest thing here is to say that you're not alone. So the biggest fear of many researchers that I've spoken to when they're, um, when they're kind of trying to deal with problems with software, problems with using or developing research software, is that they think that it's up to them to do, the only, to do everything, and it's not. Um, so they're different groups. Um, uh, one of the things that we've looked at is finding out um, how many people are affected by this. Um, a lot of people think uh, that, for instance, the number of people who are using software is maybe about 50% of the research population. It's not. It's, it's like up in the 90s. Um, there are a few people who still don't use software of any sort. Um, uh, when we were doing the survey, we had one person uh, in Imperial College in mathematics, in fact, uh, who we got a bounce message back saying, I do not read email. Please print out your email and send it to me at this address. Um, <laughs> oh, fine. You know, he replied, just had to send, a, uh, send a, 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 it by paper. So he's one of the no's in that, uh, but, but most people use software. The biggest thing here is that most people um, in research now find that their work is impossible without the software they use. So the thing here is that uh, you are definitely not alone. Like 70 percent, uh, seven out of ten people in uh, the research community across pretty much every subject in the UK relies on software. So someone's going to have hit that problem before you. Um, I'm part of the Software Sustainability Institute. One of the things that we do is try and get people together to understand where you have common problems. So um, this isn't going to be an advert for the, for the Institute, but if you have got uh, an idea for something that you think would help your community, um, please do get in touch. We might be able to help you out either with effort or with money or funding as well. Um, and a lot of the, the sorts of things that we do are to try and bring people together in workshops like this so they can share their problems. Um, so that's kind of a precursor to what we're going to be doing for the rest of the day. Um, I kind of mentioned that you're not alone. I mentioned, uh, and Rosie said that this is part of a series of different workshops. One of the things that's been happening across all of these workshops is that people have been sharing their challenges and working together on their solutions. Um, one of the things that is really, really valuable from this is to understand uh, where people have already come up with solutions that have worked for them. So in the later groups, you're going to put up a lot of challenges one of the things that I urge people to do is to also put 
point us to where they have solutions. Um, the next talk by Stephen is going to give uh, one example uh, of this, but uh, I think a lot of it is to do with understanding how you um, share your code. So particularly if you have examples about how sharing your code has benefited you, please do share them because the big challenge for a lot of researchers is to persuade others that sharing their code will not lead them to being scooped or being found out. Um, both of which I think are things which we fear, but really if we all did this as a community, we wouldn't have these kind of things. So um, I kind of talked about the whole idea of um, people no longer trusting in experts. I talked about uh, the idea of um, expertise really being based on reputation. I talked about the different ways you can trash your reputation. Hopefully I, uh, I finished by giving you different ways in which you can bolster your ability to secure your reputation. Um, I think the thing I'm going to leave you with is a reminder that expertise is really just about being expert enough. Um, and all of you have the capabilities of becoming expert enough. And I hope that this workshop will let you learn new tips and tricks to do that. Thank you very much. I'm Adam Livingston, which is a big challenge in the MSC. You mentioned about automation. <laughs> How much about that is about generalization or a generic use of scripts? And um, don't you have the same issues with your automated scripts that you have with the code that you're changing? Uh, it's a really good question. So the question was um, basically around automation and uh, firstly, I guess, uh, there, there, was, there were two parts to that question. One was um, how much can you generalize uh, this and how much is a generic problem? And the second one is, is, don't you have the same problems with your automation scripts as you do with your software? So I'll answer the second one uh, first. Yes, you do. Um, so uh, re uh, realistically, automation scripts are just pieces of code themselves, so they suffer from the same issues. Um, but the difference here is one of, uh, of what you're trying to do with software as well. So the reason why you don't create a new piece of software each time you do analysis, although maybe some of you do, uh, is because with repeated use, different bugs start um, coming out and can be addressed and fixed and so on. So the same thing with um, automation scripts. If you're able to rerun the same automation scripts, you are able to find the errors in, in that piece of code in exactly the same sort of way. And that's one of the reasons why I'm both kind of, <laughs> I'm sitting on the fence among, uh, about um, whether or not you should make things generic when it comes to automation. Um, uh, one of the things that I kind of side on, and uh, I'm at odds with a lot of my colleagues on this, is that I do not believe in making things generic early on. Um, I'm a big believer for keeping things very specific to the tasks that you have at hand and uh, gradually understanding whether or not you want to make things more generic. So does it solve the problem at hand rather than can we create something that will work not just for my problem, but all of these other similar looking problems in other domains? Um, and part of the reason for that is it keeps you more focused uh, and you don't end up with divergence of functionality because actually when you look at things um, from the top level, things that look the same turn out to be very different once you start trying them out. And it's better to kind of do it upwards rather than downwards. Um, when it comes to uh, comes to things like automation scripts, I think the the key thing is around where in the workflow they come. So can you automate things in sort of hierarchies? The disadvantage of that, obviously, is that the further down things get hidden under abstraction layers, the less you know about what's going on in different parts of your workflow. So. I'm deliberately sitting on the fence here because uh, actually it's very much down to your particular um, uh, problem and workflow. So, yeah, sorry about that. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, so, 
a really inspiring talk and hopefully we'll come back to some of those challenges later on in the day, the focus groups. Could all just take a moment to thank Leo again.